So welcome to the fourth lecture by Edward Witten, and today he will tell us about black hole thermodynamics. So it's the, today's lecture will probably be a bit of an outlier in this program on black hole thermodynamics. The real reason I wanted to give the lecture is that I realized in the first two lectures, I had explained everything you needed to know for the proof of the generalized second law, and I thought it would be a pity not to explain the proof. So black hole thermodynamics started with Jacob Bekenstein, who in 1972 asked what the second law of thermodynamics means in the presence of a black hole. So the second law says that for an ordinary system, the entropy can only increase. But if you toss a cup of tea into a black hole, the entropy seems to disappear. So Bekenstein wanted to generalize the concept of entropy so the second law would hold even in the presence of a black hole. So he wanted to assign an entropy to the black hole. So this might make you ask, what property of a black hole can only increase? Well, the answer is not the mass of the black hole. It's not true that the mass of a black hole always increases. For example, a rotating black hole can lose mass as its rotation slows down. And it's believed that that powers jets from the centers of galaxies. But there is a quantity that always increases. Just before Bekenstein's work, Stephen Hawking had proved the area theorem that says that the area of horizon of a black hole can only increase. And I'll kind of give a hint about that proof later on. But for now, we'll just say that the area of a black hole horizon can always increase. So it was fairly natural for Bekenstein to, pro to propose that the black hole entropy should be a multiple of the horizon area. For example, for a Schwarzschild black hole with this familiar metric, the horizon is at, R2, at 2 gm. The horizon area is 4 pi r squared, which is 16 pi g squared m squared. Now, since entropy is dimensionless, to relate the entropy of a black hole to its area requires a constant of proportionality with dimensions of area. And from the fundamental constants, you can actually make the Planck length or the Planck area. So in units with c equals 1, but including h bar, Bekenstein's ng, Bekenstein's formula for the area was this one except that the constant one quarter was not clear in Bekenstein's work and was provided later by Hawking in a way I'll explain. So for Schwarzschild black hole, this is the entropy. Now, Bekenstein wouldn't have had a good answer, to, I don't think, to the question why the entropy, or at least you could have asked Bekenstein, why is the entropy the area, not the area squared? But in hindsight, there is a perfectly good answer, which is that later it was understood that black hole entropy can be computed from a classical action in Euclidean space. And the classical action is precisely proportional to one power of one over h bar. And once you know that there's a one power of one over h bar, dimensionally, it has to be proportional to a, not to some other function of the area. So sometimes I said h bar equals one, but the factor one over h bar is useful to explain why black hole entropy is so large. For example, the entropy of a black hole with the mass of the sun is roughly 10 to the 20 times the entropy of the actual sun. So Bekenstein's idea was that black hole entropy captures the information lost when the black hole was formed. He interpreted it as the logarithm of the number of ways the black hole might have formed. And he proposed a generalized second law, which said that the generalized entropy would always increase. So the generalized entropy is supposed to be the black hole entropy plus S out which is supposed to be the ordinary entropy of matter and radiation outside the black hole. And so Bekenstein, so the claim is that when something falls into the black hole, S out can go down, but the area over 4GH bar increases by more. So Bekenstein made a few tests. And here's the most important one, perhaps. Shine photons with wavelength lambda and energy one over lambda on the black hole. The entropy of a single photon is at least of order one, because of two polarization states. And you can make it more a little bit by taking black holes, uh, sorry, photons that don't all have the same energy and momentum, but are on thermal equilibrium with this average energy. But the entropy per photon is still of order one. When the black hole absorbs one photon, its mass shifts by one over lambda. So its entropy shifts, well, comparing entropy before and after it makes that shift, it shifts by 8 pi g m over lambda. And Bekenstein wanted the shift in the black hole entropy to be bigger than the change in the entropy outside. And 
he observed that if the black hole is capturing a photon of size smaller than its Schwarzschild diameter, then its increase in entropy is much bigger than two pi, which is satisfactory. But Beckenstein really had a problem. He did not get a satisfactory answer if the black hole is absorbing photons at very long wavelengths, which can happen though not very efficiently. And the question really doesn't have a satisfactory answer in the framework Beckenstein assumed, which was that whatever falls behind the black hole horizon stays there forever. In thermodynamic terms, since Beckenstein assumed that the black hole does not radiate, he would have to assign it a temperature of zero. Now, thermodynamics says that at equilibrium, the change in energy and entropy will obey dE equals T dS. So dS should be dE over T. So a system with T equals zero should have dS equals infinity if dE is non-zero. <clears throat> but Beckenstein wanted the black hole to have a finite, not infinite entropy. <clears throat> so the basic problem, as Hawking showed later, is that the black hole is emitting photons of very long wavelengths. You can't analyze the absorption of very long wavelength photons by the black hole while absorbing, while ignoring emission. Famously, Stephen Hawking discovered in 1974 that at the quantum level, a black hole is not really black. It has a temperature proportional to H bar. He discovered this by analyzing quantum fields in the black hole geometry. So I've drawn the Penrose diagram of the black hole. I imagine most of you are familiar with the basics. It's a diagram in which you show only time and the radial coordinate. Space is, space time is assumed to be spherically symmetric and the angles are, are suppressed. And time and distance from the origin are depicted in the conformally mapped version by Penrose in which light rays are at a pi over two angle to the vertical. So for example, this diagonal black line, which is supposed to be at a pi over two angle from the vertical is the black hole horizon. If you're outside the horizon, you can communicate with future infinity by a causal path at an angle that's uh, no more than pi over two from the vertical. If you're behind the horizon, any causal path will end up at the singularity, this wiggly line rather than escaping to future infinity. So we think of the measurements of an outside observer as being made at future infinity. And a very important fact is that the time of the future infinity diverges at this point up here. So measurements that an observer makes at future infinity can be traced back to initial conditions of the quantum field on the Cauchy hypersurface. It's convenient to pick a hypersurface that crosses the horizon to the future of the collapsing star. So this red stuff, I should have said, is a star. It was born in the far past back here. It looks like it came from a point, but that point has room for a large distance because of the nature of the conformal mapping. Anyway, the star collapsed to the singularity and outside the star, well, we draw an initial value surface that crosses the horizon outside of the star well to the future of the collapse. So in a region that you might think is basically vacuum. And whatever will be observed at infinity can be traced back to initial conditions on this blue curve. So this picture here shows signals propagating out at the speed of light from the initial value surface to infinity. They're all meant to be at a pi over two angle from the vertical. And what it shows is that later arriving signals originated from closer to the horizon. What I didn't try to show in this diagram is the following. Time of the outside observer diverges as you approach this point up here. So if these purple lines are meant to be equally spaced in time from the point of view of an outside observer, I should show them piling up near the horizon. Instead, I drew them equally spaced in space from the point of view of an observer on this blue surface. So what will an observer at infinity see? Part of Hawking's insight was that although the full details of what the observer will see depends on the details of the collapsing star, if we ask what the observer will see in the far future after transients die down, we'll get a universal answer. So the important point, as I've said, is that a signal that's received very late originated from very close to the horizon. 
So observations made at light time are measurements of the state of the quantum fields at short distances. But every state is equivalent to the vacuum at short distances. So the light time observations of the observer probe the vacuum state near the horizon at short distances and give therefore a universal answer, regardless of how the black hole formed. So here's another picture where I try to zero in on the important region of the initial value surface near the horizon. I've just drawn a little bit of an initial value surface near but outside the horizon. Let u be a coordinate function that vanishes on the horizon, but it has a non-zero derivative at the horizon. And let t be the time at which a signal is detected by an observer at infinity, the ordinary Schwarzschild time. The relationship between u and t is this one with an integration constant c0 and corrections of order u. You find that formula by solving the geodesic equation for an outgoing null geodesic. So the definition of u didn't matter. For instance, if you rescale u, that will just shift this constant, which you can absorb in redefining the origin of time for the outside observer. And a nonlinear change in u will contribute to the order u terms, which will be even less important since we're interested in very small u. Now, the, the formula that t is logarithmically big when u is small may not sound so astounding, but if you invert it and solve for u in terms of t, you see that u is exponentially small when t is large. And in that version, it's a very dramatic formula. For instance, if you have a black hole with the mass of the sun, then after a millisecond, this exponent is order 100 or something, and u with the subplanckian. So you don't have to wait very long before the distance near the horizon from which the signal is coming is very small. Also, the UDT is very small. So a mode observed at infinity with an energy of order one will have originated from a very high energy mode near the horizon that underwent an exponentially large redshift. So any mode of any given energy E that you observe at a sufficiently late time originated from an ultra high energy mode near the horizon. That's why there's a simple answer. Roughly speaking, a mode of very high energy propagates freely along the geodesics I've been drawing. Now I'd like to stress that we don't have to think about cell Planckian distances. Um, it's up to us um, at a given time where we're making the observations, it's us to us where we put this initial value surface. We simply put it at such a moment along the horizon that the modes that we're observing up here with energies of order one originated from modes that are much shorter wavelength than the size of the black hole. So the Hawking's analysis will apply, but at energies where we understand physics. For example, for a solar mass black hole, you could put the initial value surface so that the Hawking photons that we're going to be describing originated with a wavelength of order a millimeter, for example, a wavelength where you definitely understand physics, but so small compared to the black hole size that Hawking's discussion is valid. Now the observer at infinity probes the radiation by measuring a quantum field psi of t. A typical observable will be a two point function. And we're going to make, we can make a partial wave expansion. So we look at, for a quantum field, a free quantum field in the background of the black hole, each different partial wave, angular momentum partial wave is decoupled from the others. And each one reduces, can be described by a one plus one dimensional quantum field theory. So for example, suppose the one plus one dimensional quantum field is a free fermion of dimension one half in the one plus one dimensional sense. Then it's two point function in the vacuum is given by this standard formula. And we set u equals the constant times the exponential of minus t over 4gm. And we find that the observer at infinity measures this two-point function. And you can see that that's a thermal two-point function. That's periodic in imaginary time. So it's a thermal two-point function. Well, it's antiperiodic because we did fermions. It's odd under shifting t by 8 pi gm times i. And the antiperiodicity corresponds to a thermal correlation function at the Hawking temperature, which is one over eight pi gm. 
So in other words, a black hole after transients that depend on how it was created die down, radiates thermally at this Hawking temperature, one over eight pi gm. That explains why Beckenstein had trouble making sense of the interaction of the black hole with low energy photons. He didn't know that the black hole was strongly emitting such photons. We can also confirm the value of the entropy from dE equals TDS, where E is n, the mass of the black hole, and T is one over eight pi gm. We get dS equals eight pi gm dn, or S equals four pi gm squared. And given the area of a Schwarzschild black hole, that is A over 4G, which is how Hawking determined the constant in Beckenstein's formula. So supposedly Hawking was trying to disprove Beckenstein's proposal and ended up proving it instead and determining the constant. Now, ever since Beckenstein, many researchers have thought that somehow the entropy A over 4G means the black hole can be described by some sort of degrees of freedom that live at its surface with one bit or qubit for every one over 4G of area. For instance, in a famous article in 1992, John Wheeler illustrated that idea with this picture where he imagined one bit for every unit, every Planck unit of area on the black hole horizon. The article was published in 1992, but I suspect Wheeler had been drawing such pictures for 20 years. Now, if there was more time, I would want to explain the Euclidean picture of black hole thermodynamics developed in the 70s by Gibbons, Hawking, and others. But then we wouldn't have time for modern developments that depend on ideas explained in the first two lectures. The idea that the black hole entropy should be understood in terms of entanglement entropy goes back to Raphael Sorkin in 1983. And I actually showed this slide in one of the other lectures. You divide space into two regions, A and B, and he considers, for example, the vacuum state, or really any state, and try to calculate the entropy of the reduced density matrix in the region A. And you can try to calculate that entanglement or fine-grained entropy. It turns out to be ultraviolet divergent. In two dimensions, we actually calculated the divergence, I think, in the first lecture. Sorkin's idea in modern language was that somehow gravity cuts off the divergence, leaving an entanglement entropy in the vacuum outside the horizon. That's not infinity times A, but rather A over 4G, where A is the area of the boundary between the two regions. That makes a lot of sense as it matches two ideas. One is that A over 4G is the irreducible entropy of the system for someone who can only access the region outside the horizon. And the second is Wheeler's picture where the entropy comes from microscopic degrees of freedom on the horizon. So remember, the divergence is from uh, high energy modes entangled across the horizon. So those would possibly be Wheeler's modes on the horizon. Susskind and Uglin made a very simple but important observation that strongly supports the idea of interpreting S out as entanglement entropy. If we interpret S out this way, the generalized entropy is better defined than either term is separately. So S out has this ultraviolet divergence that we've discussed, but the first term also is ultraviolet divergent because the derivation used a Baird Newton's constant, but in experiment, you imagine interpreting this formula in terms of the physical renormalized Newton's constant. When you compute in gravity, the relation between the bare Newton constant and the normalized Newton constant involves an ultraviolet divergence, which in one loop order is h bar to the zero times lambda squared, where lambda is an ultraviolet cutoff. So you see that S out is of order h bar to the zero, and its divergent part is also h bar to the zero. But the ultraviolet divergent part in one over g h bar is also quadratically divergent and is also of order h bar to the zero. So both divergent terms are of order the area times h bar to the zero. And Susskind and Uglum showed somewhat casually, others later did it more precisely, that the ultraviolet divergences in S out cancel those in the area term. So it seems that the generalized entropy is well-defined, although neither term is separately. That's an extremely simple but important observation.
Now, 21st century developments have supported these ideas, though leaving us with lots of mystery. So one of the most important, one of the first important 21st century developments is something I already told you about, Cassini's interpretation and proof of the Beckenstein bounds. So I explained Cassini's work, but I'll just very briefly say how it was related to black hole thermodynamics. Beckenstein, eight years after his original paper, reconsidered the generalized second law. When a black hole of mass M and radius 2GM absorbs a body of size curly R, energy E, and entropy S. And um, he found that the generalized second law would require that 8 pi GM E would be bigger than uh, the entropy of the body. And if you naively assume that a black hole of Schwarzschild diameter 4 GM can only absorb a body of size curly R, if curly R is bounded by 4 GM, then the inequality Beckenstein needs has the property that Newton's constant cancels out. And it leads to the Beckenstein bound that we discovered, discussed on Monday. So we actually already discussed Monday, a 21st of century development related to black hole thermodynamics this Beckenstein bound. And as I explained, it caused a lot of mystery, but eventually Cassini made sense out of it. So what we're going to do today is to discuss something more subtle, which is the validity of the generalized second law. But first let's discuss what the generalized second law means. Microscopically, we might say that the entropy of a quantum system is given by the von Neumann entropy. And the von Neumann entropy is defined, the thermodynamic entropy is only defined for systems that are close enough to equilibrium, at least locally. But the von Neumann entropy, of course, is always defined. So the, the relation between the two is that in thermal equilibrium, the two types of entropy are the same. Of course, in general, they're not the same. And the von Neumann entropy can be much less. When a system is thermalized, we don't normally mean literally its density matrix is a thermal density matrix, which is very hard to achieve for a macroscopic system. What we mean really is that simple measurements don't enable us to distinguish rho from rho thermal. In such a situation, the microscopic von Neumann entropy is less than the thermal entropy, possibly much less. The thermal entropy is what you get if you coarse grain and approximate the actual rho as rho thermal. So the, in the, if you consider the second law, the two types of entropy are completely different. Consider an isolated system, say a fluid in a box, possibly in an inhomogeneous state. It undergoes unitary quantum evolution, which doesn't change the eigenvalues of the density matrix. So it doesn't change the von Neumann entropy. So there's no second law for the von Neumann entropy of an isolated system. But thermodynamic entropy, of course, does increase. If the fluid is initially inhomogeneous, you would describe its entropy as the integral over x of an entropy density that depends on the local pressure and temperature. After a while, the fluid thermalizes and the temperature and pressure become uniform and the thermal dynamic entropy will have increased because of coarse graining over microscopic information that's lost when it thermalizes. In the Beckenstein Hawking entropy, the area term is, is regarded as a coarse graining over unobserved internal structure of the black hole. So it's a kind of thermodynamic entropy. And therefore we can hope for a generalized second law. Well, what's S out? Well, okay, so that's not precisely the way I, the way I organize my slides is to recall, okay. Let me present it the way I have in my slides. So Beckenstein had this generalized second law. We can ask if it's true. The classical limit is the Hawking area theorem. And whenever we're near a classical limit and the black hole is growing, the generalized second law is true because the area term dominates. So the increase in the area term dominates whatever else is happening, except when the area term is zero. So to challenge the generalized second law in a more interesting way, we can consider a stationary black hole, such as a Schwarzschild black hole, where classically the ADT is zero. We let the black hole interact with quantum fields and ask what happens to the generalized entropy. 
what do we have to mean by the outside entropy if the generalized second law is to be true? Well, if the quantum fields are in a state where thermodynamic entropy makes sense, we'll be back in the situation that Beckenstein studied in his original paper, where the black hole was absorbing photons that he treated classically, and the generalized second law is easily satisfied. The challenge is to ask if the generalized second law is true for an arbitrary state of quantum fields outside the black hole. In that generality, we have to use the microscopic or fine-grained entropy, the von Neumann entropy, because that's the only entropy that makes sense universally. But of course, there's another reason that we have to use the von Neumann entropy for S out, because Susskind and Oglum showed that if we use S out as the von Neumann entropy, then the generalized entropy actually makes sense. But if we think that S out is thermodynamic entropy, then the generalized entropy won't make sense. It'll have an ultraviolet divergence in the renormalization of Newton's constant, and we won't know what to say. So the generalized entropy, sorry, S out has to be the von Neumann entropy, both because it's the only one that makes sense for the ultraviolet divergence, and also it's the only one that makes sense in the general for general quantum state that we want to test. Now, before doing anything fancy, let's consider a black hole all alone in empty space emitting Hawking radiation and make sure that in that case, the generalized second law isn't violated. The answer is that S gen increases. A black hole emitting Hawking radiation at temperature TH into the vacuum, where the vacuum is temperature zero, is a thermodynamically irreversible process that increases the entropy. This was estimated carefully by Don Page in the 70s, but I'll make a simple estimate. During a time delta tau, the black hole emits thermal radiation that fills a shell of thickness L, which is C delta tau. So this gray shell is meant to be the radiation emitted in a time delta tau. So let N be the effective number of partial waves in which the outgoing radiation is emitted. N is finite because there's an effective angular momentum barrier that I didn't discuss, which puts an effective cutoff on the angular momentum of an outgoing mode. Effectively, the shell contains N modes of one plus one dimensional massless chiral fields at temperature T Hawking. So the energy and entropy densities are these from standard one plus one dimensional formulas. So the change in energy and entropy of the radiation during time tau well, if you compare these two formulas, you see that E is T over two times S. So delta E of the radiation is T Hawking over two times delta S of the radiation. Or in other words, delta S is two over the temperature times delta E. Or that two is important in a moment. Conservation of energy says the energy gained by the radiation is the energy lost by the black hole during the same time. So delta E of the radiation is minus delta E of the black hole. The black hole is emitting radiation adiabatically, so it's change in energy and entropy satisfied dE equals TDS. In other words, for the black hole, delta E is T times delta S, or delta S is one over T times delta E. But for the radiation, delta S was two over T times delta E. So the entropy gained by the radiation is twice the entropy lost by the black hole. And that just measures the fact that the black hole is radiating not out of equilibrium into the vacuum at zero temperature. So we've verified the generalized second law for the case of a black hole radiating into the vacuum. But can we give a completely general proof of the generalized second law for a stationary black hole interacting with quantum fields in any state? Yes, as was shown by Aaron Wall. And here we have to use not just the positivity of relative entropy, which went into um, the Beckenstein bound, but the monotonicity of relative entropy. So I just remind you what that monotonicity said. We discussed it in the first lecture. U and V will be two regions of space where V is smaller than U. And rho U and rho V are the density matrices of two states of a quantum field for observations in region U. Similarly, rho v and sigma v in region v. Then, monotonicity of relative entropy says that the relative entropy in the smaller region is less than that in the bigger region. How are we going to apply that for the generalized second law? 
Well, the regions U and V will consider are the following. U stretches from the horizon to spatial infinity. And V stretches from the horizon to spatial infinity at a later time. Well, in what sense does the later cut lead to a smaller region? So in what sense is V smaller than U? Well, one answer is to look at the domain of dependence. So the region U has the domain of dependence that I've drawn in green. All the physics in the green region is determined by what there was on U. And here's the domain of dependence of the V region. So you see that U predicts the physics in a larger portion of space-time than V. But and there's another way to look at it, which is technically useful, which is to use a different initial value surface that has the same domain of dependence. For this, we take the initial value surface to hug the horizon plus future infinity outside the horizon. So we replace U with this one. This is a new U. It encompasses the future, future null infinity and also the part of the horizon to the future of the old, of the cut determined by the old U. So our new U is this one with the same domain of dependence. And then the later cut is literally just a smaller initial value surface. Here's U cut in this new way and here's V. So U is simply in this sense, a smaller initial value surface um, to which we can apply the inequality of monotonicity of relative entropy. Then rather as in the discussion of the Beckenstein bound, we, ex we expand the relative entropy as the sum of two terms. One term is minus, well, okay, there are going to be two states in the discussion, just as there were in, um, well, where relative entropy is the relative entropy between two states. I haven't told you what they are yet. Rho will be the state in which we're actually testing the generalized second law. Sigma will be something convenient. No matter what sigma is, we have this inequality. So in proving the Beckenstein bound, Cassini had chosen sigma to be the vacuum. And we'll also, Aaron Wall makes a convenient choice of sigma in proving the generalized second law. So anyway, we write the general, the relative entropy as the sum of two terms. One is minus the entropy of the state of interest. And the second term um, is minus the trace of the density matrix of that state times log sigma, where log sigma is something that will be chosen for convenience. So S of rho by definition is S out. S out by definition is the von Neumann entropy of the density matrix outside the horizon. And the inequality will be that S out at the cut at the time V or at the cut V minus E at the time V is bigger than S out at U minus E at U. Now, if I let delta S out be S out at V minus S out at U, and likewise delta A be area at V minus area at U, the inequality we want is that delta area over 4GH bar plus delta S out is non-negative. And you can see that the inequality we have, this one, will be the one we want if we can pick sigma so that with the help of the Einstein equations, the change in E, the change in e will be minus the change in the area over 4GH bar. If there is any state sigma such as such that this is true, then uh, this inequality will become the generalized second law. Uh, to let the cat a little bit out of the bag, if we're discussing a short shield black hole, the sigma for which this is true is what's called the hardle hawking state. So um, we need to understand what kind of sigma will have the property that the change in this matrix element will be related by the Einstein equations to the change in the area. So for that, we'll have to look at quantum fields on a null plane, the null plane being the horizon. So we could start in Minkowski space. 
which I've written with two light cone coordinates and some transverse spatial coordinates. And let n be the null plane where u is zero. So uh, the analogy is that the horizon is also a null plane. The outgoing radial null geodesics, the horizon is, <clears throat> is a null surface. Because in my Penrose diagram, it was at a pi over two angle to the vertical, which meant that the radial outgoing geodesics are null rays that live inside the horizon. And they're analogous to the null rays that are parameterized by V, or sorry, parameterized by U at a fixed V, or by V at a fixed U. So let N be the null plane where U is zero. And now we make a cut at V equals zero. I should have said that the horizon, the, this null plane contains null lines at a fixed X that are parameterized by V. We've already set U to zero to define the plane. So the, those null rays are like the outgoing null geodesics in the horizon. And the domain of dependence of the region above this cut in Minkowski space is a Rindler wedge because any signal above two dimensions, any signal in this region will eventually propagate forwards and cross this null surface. So if we're only able to make, well, we already computed the density matrix of Rindler space, but we can think of it as the density matrix on a null surface above the cut at V equals zero, because measurements, physics in this region can be traced back to initial data on the null surface. You see a time, a future going path in here would have to cross this surface, but above two dimensions, a null path will do so also unless it's precisely going parallel, which would be a set of measure zero. So suppose we're only making observations on and above the cut. Well, we already know from the first lecture. I, I'm, I'm sorry, there a certain interview, but I got a bit lost. So you said that we need to understand quantum fields in our plane, but uh, why do we need to understand them? Because I got a bit lost what exactly I'm trying to do at this stage. We want to, well, I want to show you that for a short chilled black hole, the hartle hawking state has the property as I, I see. Now the, heart, the, the horizon is a null surface. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand something about physics on a null surface, quantum physics on a null surface in general. Mm -hmm. Which by the way has a lot of applications to things such as the average null energy condition and all kinds of other stuff. But Also I'm a bit unsure, like I don't understand. On the one hand you said that when, when, when you said uh, uh, when you started talking about this generalized second law, the level of rigor was very unclear. You said Saskin showed something, but it was not clear what exactly they showed and so on. But now we kind of, so I'm, I'm not sure what is actually even our framework. Uh, are we considering classical gravity and quantum fields on it? Is there back reaction of fields on gravity? What is the framework? Framework is quantum fields in a gravitational background, but we will include the, the gravitational back reaction to first order. Okay. Uh, and it's... The, the statement that the generalized entropy is uh, is well defined is pretty rigorous in perturbation theory, I think. But it's certainly rigorous for first order in the gravitational back reaction. Uh -huh. um, Soskin and Uglin gave a simple argument that wasn't completely general. Other people later generalized it and did it more precisely. I think this is quite convincing. And, so could could is it, is this conceivable that okay uh, for example could we actually compute this at least in principle this uh, um, entropy in some sort of Monte Carlo solution to check I just wanted to, I would be kind of more more comfortable with this with going into the proof before I uh, if I knew that these objects that I discussed are actually concrete and computable. <laughs> If there's a state you're actually interested, you, yeah. it's going to be hard work because computing entanglement entropies is not easy. Yeah. This is definitely well defined. If you have a state that you have a Monte Carlo description, if you have a state that you have some kind of concrete computer description of on a lattice outside the horizon, you could compute its a state of the quantum fields on a specialized surface that crosses the horizon. You can compute its entanglement entropy outside the horizon. And you will get a divergent term plus a finite correction. And mm -hmm. you certainly can compute that finite correction. It's definitely meaningful. And 
people have to some extent. We're definitely discussing things that are well defined. I'm sorry if I'm going too fast. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry also to interrupt you, but uh, no, yeah, I, actually, I just thought that. Sorry to be interrupted. Then. I just. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. But just to clarify, so but then the the gravitational, the, so the, the evolution of the geometry is completely classical. It's like just affected by the the average stress tensor. Or... Yes, we're about to include a lowest order correction, back correction of matter on the geometry, where we will simply incorporate the first order correction to Einstein's equation with the expectation value of the stress tensor. That's what we're about to do, and we'll find that um, we'll find that uh, Einstein's equations will precisely give us what we need. What we need in the case of a short chill black hole, the state signal will be the horizontal Hawking state. And we need to know that the back reaction um, shifts the area in order, we'll compute the change in the area due to back reaction in order h bar, and it will precisely lead to this formula such that the inequality of monotonicity relative entropy will turn into the generalized second law. Mm -hmm. But you see, we need to understand more general cuts of null surfaces and even more general null surfaces because the only cut of a null surface we've discussed so far is this flat null surface above a cut at v equals zero. That corresponds to Rindler space. So we already know the density matrix of Rindler space. But we need to understand more general density matrices for null surfaces. So I think I forgot a factor of two pi here, but oh no, it's written here, sorry. So we already know that, that, that the density matrix of Rindler space is this one. And K is the Lorentz generator, which can be written as an integral on this plane above the null surface. So previously I wrote it as an integral over the space surface, but instead of writing it, the, the conserved charge integral of the Lorentz generator can be written as an integral on the surface, but it, it can equally well be written as an integral over this surface. So the formula that we're going to use now for K is this one. So it's a partial Lorentz boost operator that boost fields in the right Rindler space does nothing in the left Rindler space and does something complicated in the past and future wedges. So we want to generalize this for a more general cut of the null plane of the form V equals F of X. So we pick an arbitrary function F of the transverse coordinates and we consider the region where V is bigger than F of X. And we want the density matrix of the quantum field in the green region. So let n plus comma f be the region where v is bigger than f. So the domain of dependence of n plus f is a wiggly generalization of the Rindler region, but I didn't try to draw it. To find the density matrix that describes measurements in n plus comma f or its domain of dependence, we'll use the symmetries of operators on the null plane. Consider first the operator p that generates translations in v. It's this one. It annihilates the vacuum and it's strictly positive on all other states. It generates translations of operators in the null plane and all other operators, of course. So if F is a constant, it does this to an operator on the null plane. Now take a general F of X and let piece of F be this more general, generalized version of the null translation operator. We're going to use it to map the cut at V equals zero to the cut at V equals F. P sub F isn't a symmetry operator. It doesn't commute with Hamiltonian. Off of the null plane N, it probably does very complicated things. But on the null plane, it's simple. First, the null translation P and Lorentz boost K have simple commutators with P sub F. And these imply that P sub F annihilates the vacuum. You see, since P sub F commutes with P, P sub F on the vacuum is a state of P equals zero. The only one is the vacuum. But if P sub F on the vacuum was lambda times the vacuum, the second commutator forces lambda to be zero. So P sub F has to annihilate the vacuum. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the key point is that e to the IPF conjugates operators in the region n plus on the null plane above the standard cut to operators in the region n plus f above the v equals f cut. They don't do that in a simple way. If f is constant, the, conjug the conjugate of O of V and X is O of V plus F and X. But if F isn't constant, there are additional terms involving derivatives of F. But for any given O, this is a finite series because it involves operators of lower and lower dimension as we take more and more derivatives of F. So if O is any operator of finite dimension, this series terminates after finitely many terms. I think it's important it terminates after finitely many terms because it means that we get a well-defined local operator rather than a formal series we wouldn't understand. So this is a finite series that stops after finitely many steps. So the important point is that conjugation by e to the IPF maps observables in the standard half null plane to observables. Uh, I'm sorry, how do we know that these operators, they, they will have uh, lower and lower dimension? Do we know something about the dimension of this operator in the right-hand side? Uh, I'm going to assume that at least in the UV, we had a CFT or possibly an asymptotically free theory. So I measure dimension either in the UV CFT or else um, using asymptotic freedom in the limited but, tree. But, but how do we know that this, this conjugation operation cannot raise dimension? So I missed this point because I, I, I'm, yeah, I don't have much intuition at this point. So I'm trying to follow formally and then oh. I'm a bit lost. So. Well, I can use dimensional analysis. So if you actually try to calculate, if f is constant, you'll get only the first term. If f isn't constant, you'll get... So the first term... If f isn't constant, you'll get terms involving derivatives of f. But you can apply dimensional analysis to those. In a... If we actually had a conformal field theory, we'd literally apply dimensional analysis. But in general, we might only have a conformal field theory or in the UV or an asymptotically free theory. But still, operators have a triangular structure that they can only mix with operators of lower dimension. So, um, is, is, these derivatives are, are they taken at point X? Because it's, uh, yeah, why, why can't you get just something more complicated, non local? Yeah, it's not clear to me why it should be demanded. Why this derivative expansion? You know, the moment we know the derivative expansion, maybe I can argue, but why should there be derivative? Why can't it be just some nonlinear, complicated because integral? Well, because at different values of the, nor of the transverse coordinates, the operators are at space like separation. So in a null plane, the only operators that are not at space-like separation are the ones selected by a null array, connected by a null array. So if we were at finite separation away from the null array, uh, we'd be measuring a commutator at space-like separation. Okay. So yeah, that, 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 that was the piece of intuition that I was missing. Okay, thanks. Okay. So conjugation by E to the IPF maps observables in the half null plane to observables in the above the cut region. So we've learned two facts about this conjugation. It leaves the vacuum invariant, and it's an isomorphism between observables in region N plus and observables in region N plus comma F. So therefore conjugation by E to the IPF will transform the density matrix in the standard cut region to the density matrix in the Wigley cut region. So the density matrix we know is conjugated by E to the IPF into the density matrix sigma f. And since the log of sigma zero was minus two pi k, the log of sigma f is minus two pi k f, where I just replace v by v minus f in the formula for sigma naught. So, a small generalization of this formula plus some discussion of Einstein's equations gives the generalized second law. But before going there, I want to explain a heuristic explanation of the result, which is due to wall. So as I said in answering your question, there's no causal relations between operators on different null lines on the null plane. So operators on different null lines are space-like separated and commute. As, so as far as the construction of the Hilbert space is concerned, a theory in the null plane is like an infinite tensor product of one plus one dimensional theories parameterized by X. In each of those theories, 
at any given x. F is just a number, and e to the IPF is a symmetry operator that conjugates the density matrix by V to V plus F, mapping K to KF. Then we get log sigma F by integrating the resulting formula over F. It's over F, not over KF. So I'll explain the following. If you can make a lattice regularization of the theory in the X directions while maintaining one plus one dimensional point gray invariance, then this argument is rigorous because the treatment of the density matrix was rigorous in each one plus one dimensional theory. So if we can really treat this theory as a limit of a lattice of one plus one dimensional theories, then this heuristic explanation on this page becomes rigorous. So now we need to navigate toward black hole horizons. So first of all, the black hole horizon is a null surface swept out by light like geodesics called horizon generators. So for the Schwarzschild black hole, these are the outgoing light like geodesics. So there's a null coordinate V on the horizon and calling it null means that the coefficient of dv squared and dv dxa is zero. So the general form of the metric of any black hole horizon is this, without assuming it's an, a, a Schwarzschild horizon or anything simple. That's a universal form for the metric on any black hole horizon. We can also insist that V is an affine parameter on each null geodesic. The metric GAB of X and B is not arbitrary. There's a constraint equation. The Einstein equations give constraint equations on the initial value, condition, initial value data, analogous to um, Coulomb's law, which is a constraint equation in gauge theory. On a null plane, there's just one constraint equation, which is sometimes often called the Rachidori equation but it's, it's simply a component of the Einstein equation. So the constraint equation is just this equation, GVV is eight pi G times TVV. It involves no V derivatives. So it's a constraint on the initial data. We could call it the einstein rachidori sachs equation because in the form I'm about to write is due to Sachs. So let boldface A be the determinant of this spatial metric, which has D minus two components. And let theta be A inverse DVA. Sorry, I said that this equation has no V derivatives. I should have said it has no U derivatives. V is a coordinate inside the initial value surface. So a time derivative off the initial value surface would be a U derivative. This equation has no U derivatives. So it constrains the initial data. And the constraint equation is the one I've written here. And Almost everything you can Edward, you can't hear anymore. You, I think you muted yourself. Okay, I'm not sure when I muted myself. Uh, did I explain that this that this is going to be the, a component of the Einstein equation? Uh, uh, we, have the, we have this form of the metric. Yes. Yeah, you, you, you muted yourself after you said that this was explained why this was a constraint equation. Okay, well, I misstated it. I don't know if I misstated it before or after muting myself. So it's a, this U, V is here treated as a space coordinate. So a constraint equation is one that doesn't have U derivatives. Yeah. There's one component of the Einstein equation that doesn't have U derivatives. It's this one, which is sometimes called the Rachidori equation, but you could call it the einstein rachidori sachs equation. And um, almost everything that's useful in general relativity that you might not have learned in the first course follows from this equation. So um, if you set bold phase A to be the square root of the determinant of this D, D minus two component metric and let theta be A inverse DVA, then the constraint equation is this one. where sigma is the traceless part of dv of g. So that's simply a component of the Einstein equations. And before deducing from it the generalized second law, I'm going to spend a moment to explain the classical limit of the generalized second law, which is the Hawking area theorem. So the point is that everything on the right-hand side is negative, by virtue of which you can prove that if there's anywhere on the horizon with theta negative, then theta will go to minus infinity at finite v 
which you can show is a contradiction. That step isn't completely trivial and I won't take the time for it unless I'm asked in questions later. But it, modulo this step, the equation shows that theta has to be everywhere positive. And since theta is the local increase of the area density of the horizon, theta being everywhere null negative is the Hawking area theorem. So that's the classical limit of the generalized second law. And now we're going to compute the first quantum correction. So the classical limit, theta was non-negative since theta was A inverse dVA. Theta non-negative means that the area density on the horizon is everywhere non-decreasing. So therefore, the area, which is the integral of both phase A, is everywhere increasing. So that's the Hawking area theorem, the classical limit of the generalized second law. So for the generalized second law, we consider a horizon that classically has constant area and we study quantum effects. To make the area constant, theta should be zero. And for that to be true while V is increasing, the constraint equation tells us that on the right-hand side, everything is zero. So in particular, we need a, a situation where classically TVV was zero and we'll only get quantum contributions in TVV. And also we need sigma to be zero. But theta and sigma being zero, theta and sigma were the traceless and trace parts of the, the V derivative of G. So we learned that the horizon metric is stationary independent of the null time. So the horizon metric for the interesting case for the generalized second law was stationary V independent like, like the metric of the Schwarzschild solution. Now we wanna turn on effects of order H bar. So in the constraint equation, we'll consider effects of order H bar in TVV. On the right hand side, since theta and sigma were zero classically, they're of order h bar and we'll, we can ignore them in order h bar. We'll think of them as being of order h bar squared. Since A is constant classically, its first and second derivatives are both of order h bar. So dv of theta, which is dv of A inverse dVA is the same as A inverse dV squared of A plus order h bar squared. So the expectation value of the constraint equation simplifies. We can drop these two terms. We get minus eight pi G times the expectation value of TVV times the classical value of A. Where TVV is the expectation value in whatever quantum state the system is in. On the right hand side, we can use the classical V independent value of A, which I called A classical since TVV is of order H bar. So A H bar is the order H bar correction to A. So we've gotten a simple equation for the back reaction in order H bar. And the solution that has sensible behavior as V goes to infinity is this one, where I've dropped a possible additive term that won't be important. It's an additive constant, so it won't affect whether the generalized second law is true. Integrating over the transverse coordinates, we, learn, we get a formula for the order H bar correction to the area on a cut at V equals F, which is this one. So the order H bar correction to A over 4G along a cut is this. So to put the pieces together of what I've told you, suppose there's a state whose density matrix sigma F in the region to the future of the cut satisfies this. We'll find that state in a moment, but to let the cat out of the bag for short chilled black hole, it's the hard locking state. Then the order H bar correction to the black hole entropy, well, it's given by this formula, but if there's a state where that is uh, log sigma F. Can I ask a question? Yeah, let me finish the sentence. Yeah. Then the order H bar contribution to the black hole entropy measured on the cut is the trace of rho F log sigma F, where rho is the density matrix for the state we're studying, and sigma is the convenient state that had this density matrix. Yes, what's your question? But the question is that, okay, I would imagine that a really careful proof would somehow also include uh, these corrections which are divergent and which should somehow should nicely cancel. Uh, but here, 
We know that there are these divergences, but uh, uh, we do one loop computation implicitly, but somehow uh, these corrections are never explicit, these divergences. So the well, divergence is proportional to the area. Yeah, uh, the fact that G is divergent and there is a one or the one term somehow. Well, the arrangement of the area is the same on the two cuts. But how do we know that there is no like order one correction which somehow we are missing? We're studying the order one correction. But the, the, but the formula you wrote, it's not strictly speaking finite because it involves G, but you're using the classical G and involves this density matrix, which is so also divergent. So we're calculating in perturbation D and we're computing the first quantum correction to the classical formulas. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, a bit destabilized by the fact that you, you know that there are two effects which affect this formula, the divergence and this correction, and somehow uh, we are not we are treating them well, separately and not in one in one of the same argument. Well, it's a little bit similar to what we did for the Bakunin bound. So the relative entropy was a sum of two terms that are both divergent, but we added and subtracted something to write it as the sum of two terms that were both finite. One was a difference in entropies, one was a difference in areas. We've done something like this here. So the entropies were both finite, but the, the relative entropy, which is rigorously defined and positive, we wrote as an entropy difference, which is finite, and also an area difference that's also finite. Okay. So uh, if we do have uh, a state with this density matrix, then the order H bar correction to the black hole entropy on the cut is this one. And the right hand side is what we had in the inequality we had before. So, given such a state, so if sigma has that property, then the relative entropy between rho and sigma on any cut is minus the entropy of rho, minus the area, well, minus this thing, the order H bar correction to the area on the cut at F. And now suppose we have two cuts, G and F with F G to the future of F. I've drawn a different picture, which is more what the black hole looks like to an outside observer. To the black hole outside of, in the pictures I've drawn so far, we emphasize that the horizon is a null surface, which is what you would see if you were crossing the horizon. To an outside observer, the black hole looks like a stationary object. So I'm here visualizing the black hole as a time independent object. But the vertical direction in this picture is the null V direction in the discussion. We have two cuts G and F with G to the future of F. And then monotonicity of relative entropy says that one relative entropy is bigger than the other. And this formula for the relative entropy becomes the generalized second law. So to finish the argument, we need to know that for a general stationary horizon, we can find a state sigma such that for any cut, the reduced density matrix is this one. Now for a Schwarzschild black hole, it's the hartle hawking state. But this state actually exists for an arbitrary metric on the horizon. I don't have to know it's a metric that would come from an actual global solution of Einstein's equations. I can reason as follows. There's a trick in the argument. So you have to listen carefully or it will seem like I'm pulling the wool over your eyes. Well, first of all, we've already found the state for a Rindler horizon where we allowed an arbitrary cut. In that case, the state was just the Minkowski vacuum. But, and so the Rindler horizon is the case where the horizon was the transverse RD minus two and the metric was flat. Now we want an arbitrary horizon, any topology, any metric. Physically, in the black hole solution, the horizon metric only takes this form sufficiently far to the future. But whatever that metric is, we can imagine a space time with that metric, which has a null surface in which the metric has this form at all times. Well, let me say it even better. I'm going to consider an auxiliary space, which will be two dimensional Minkowski space times H. H is the black hole horizon we're interested in a surface with this metric. I would just consider this space time. And as we discussed yesterday, quantum field theory in that space time makes sense because it's time independent. So there's a vacuum state. 
and let omega be the ground state of our quantum field theory in this space time. So in our analysis of Rindler space, we were in R11 times Rd minus two. Now we're in R11 times something else. But the arguments only use two dimensional point Poincare symmetry. So we can repeat the whole discussion. And if sigma is the density matrix of the vacuum in this space time, it'll have the property we wanted. So that concludes my explanation of the generalized second law. I just have a couple of further remarks and then I'll finish. First, the facts I've explained about quantum fields in the null plane are also used in the entropic approach to the 40A theorem. And the same facts are used in the average null energy condition of quantum field theory, probably in other applications that I'm forgetting to mention. So I've explained facts that have various applications although we've only had time for one, which was to the generalized second law. Anyway, thank you for the patience with all these lectures. Thank you. Thank you very much for these super nice lectures. Questions? Well, I, I have a question immediately about this last argument. Uh, so, so why it's not important that, uh, I mean, the, the actual black hole geometry is not this R11 comma times H. So We're just it's not to... important that, that the oh. geometry where you're preparing this state sigma is, is not the actual geometry of the black hole. Why is it important? Uh, we prepare the state on initial, well, in general, if you pick an initialized surface, you can prepare a state on that surface. And then how it evolves depends on what the geometry is off that surface. Right. So we don't care what there is to the future of the surface. However, what is true is that in the black hole space time, take the initial value surface in this space time at u equals zero. That's a complete null surface. The geodesics are complete in both directions. In the black hole space time, we only have that space time to the future. Right. But we only wanted the density matrix in the future. So we take the vacuum state of the, we take the vacuum state in this space time and compute its constructed density matrix to the future of some cup. And that region makes a, exists in the black hole space time. So we then just literally import that state into the black hole space time. I see, thank you. By the way, Joe, before the lecture you asked me yesterday, uh, well, you pointed out that most of yesterday's lecture wasn't in my lecture notes. There's a piece of it that was, which was the construction of the von Neumann algebras from thermofield doubles. Mm. I explained it more physically yesterday, but uh, the formulas are written out and you can explain in more detail in those lecture notes. I see, so. thank you. So, Story about quantum field theory, why quantum field theory makes sense in curved space time is definitely not in those lectures. Sorry. I had, hi, thank you so much for the great lectures. I had one small question. Yes. Uh, given that the Penrose diagram that you've used is not uh, the correct one if the black hole eventually evaporates. Yes. How do the arguments about the domain of dependence of these various surfaces that you've chosen change? Well, you have to assume that it makes sense to do perturbation theory, even though uh, it's true that perturbation theory would break down at asymptotically large, large times. So, uh, I mean, a pragmatic answer is that instead of being at spatial infinity, we take a, a null surface that's very light, but not at infinity. So very light means very light compared to the size of the black hole, but not so light that Hawking radiation becomes important. And have, okay, and have people considered maybe a yet more generalized version of this argument, which also includes the fact that the black hole evaporates and the topology changes? I think, I believe not. I don't think a, okay, I think a significant improvement of this argument is known. I'm actually thank surprised so the paper isn't better known. It has about 130 citations, which is definitely a decent number. But to be honest, I would have thought it would have had more. 
that's actually partly why I wanted to lecture about it. So this argument really proves that it's increasing maybe uh, for as long as the black hole has not evaporated or up to the page time or what precisely is the statement? Is it the page time that it's important in this uh, inequality? That's a good question. I don't think the generalized entropy is going to stop increasing at the page time. Well, okay. Um, I see. No, uh, well, yeah, okay. Sorry, to discuss, it be. to discuss, I, 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 I gave an ill thought out answer. I don't think I can give a good answer, to be honest. But if we want to discuss, uh, I would, we, we may the do, okay, go ahead. If the generalized entropy is defined to be the, uh, uh, sorry, the fine-grained entropy of the out stuff, it has yeah. to go eventually to zero. If the black hole formed from a pure state. Yes, you're correct. So it, so this inequality cannot persist for all times. It must break down at some point. Yeah. Right, you're correct. So, I don't think I'm going to know what to say about it, but we can think whether we can say anything at all. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. But I mean, the fact that we are in the proof, right? We are using uh, quantum field theory in a, in a fixed background, or we, we can do just changing the geometry to first order, right? So that's all we did, yes. So to really get back the pure state from the black hole evaporation, yes. this, this should be way beyond this, this calculation, right? Yes, I think that's correct. We didn't input any knowledge of the state of the black hole or how it formed. So if you want to know what's happening at the page time, you do need to know something about how the black hole formed. But literally this, I've been telling you about a paper that was written about 10 years ago, and I don't think there's been any improvement since then in this argument. But should we not regard the understanding of the page curve as a, as a step in the same direction? In general, yes, for understanding black hole entropy. It's just not clear what is the content of this statement given that it eventually starts decreasing. Is it a statement about the first couple of steps of the evolution or is it a statement up to the page time? It's, well, we literally computed to lowest. Uh, I think we gave an argument that would have satisfied Beckinson. So we had an arbitrary quantum state interacting with the black hole and uh can i make a comment uh, about that actually uh well just let me finish that sorry, yeah so we extended the classical hawking area theorem to a semi-classical generalized entropy theorem and even in contemporary papers that do use um that do explore more quantum things uh this structure of the gen this generalized second law argument is still used for example, it's used to prove that um, when people prove that Ru Takinagi surfaces are behind horizons, they're basically using the generalized second law in this version that we proved. And so that's input to analyses where people do analyze the page curve. So this argument not only isn't superseded, but it's used in new ways in contemporary papers. But go ahead, Raghu, if that was you. Uh, basically, you said what I was going to say is S out is the entropy in a simple description on the semi-classical background. So the object that you wrote down should continue to increase basically until the time the black hole is completely gone. To get the page curve, we need to include these other region behind the horizon, as you just said. So, Well, you see, a slight problem with what you said is that as I defined it, S out was simply the entropy of the outside system, the von Neumann entropy of the system outside. Right, but the outside system as described in the gravity path integral of matter fields coupled to the metric. Oh, that's true. That's, that's right. Uh, yeah, Raghu is making a good point. So, um, yeah, the, the discussion was tied to quantum fields interacting with a background metric. And if that pick framework breaks down, then certainly our discussion will break down. Uh, I think Raghu is probably making a crucial point. I also have a question about the 
the equation, Rai Chaudhary equation, uh, yeah. replacing the TVV uh, with the expectation value. Yes. I think maybe Slava was asking this, but that expectation value also suffers from UV divergences. Like we have to do some point splitting regularization of. Well, we did, but um, we regularize the stress tensor so that it's zero in Minkowski space. When we've done that, we've handled the divergences. And then it's well defined in any space time. Uh, yeah, what, what I wanted to ask was that that one loop equation, is it only true in some regularization schemes or is regularization it? Scheme. We regularize so that the stress tensor has zero expectation value in the vacuum. We also did that when we discussed the Bekenstein bound. The formula really had another term, which was the expectation value of the operator K in the vacuum. And then I just said that with the standard regularization of the stress tensor, that's zero. I see, okay. So, um, Okay, thanks. Yeah. Everything, is well, everything in this analysis is well defined and finite. Um, I can't see where I've. Got okay, yeah, 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 makes sense. Thanks. Once, the stress, once you stipulate that the stress tensor is defined so its vacuum expectation value is zero, then it's well defined in any space time. Supposedly, yesterday, I convinced you that quantum field theory and curved space time makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that means if you perturb around Minkowski space, well, in, in some space times, you said that uh, it's not I'm, I'm joking, of course, but we're in that situation. I actually had a question about, uh, so you mentioned this proof of ANIC on the last page. Yes. So could you comment on, on the status of this proof? Because uh, you mentioned that some of these proofs, quote unquote, of the C theorem and so on, they are not actually in perfect shape because they operate with some objects not really properly regularized and you know if you're a mathematician if you're a mathematician the entropic proofs of the c theorem aren't rigorous theorems uh, personally i consider them quite convincing i actually disagree because it's not a question of mathematics i mean if, if a physically regulator would exist which would be Lorentz invariant and finite that would be i mean it's a physics uh, problem it's not a mathematics problem but my question was different. Uh, so these proofs of ANIC that you also mentioned, are they at the same level of rigor as, uh, do they suffer from the same uh, subtleties as the proof of the A theorem using these techniques or are in better shape? I think they're better, but I actually want to say again that I disagree with you about the proofs involving strong subadditivity. And uh, there really are a lot of important extensions of those arguments. I only gave the simplest for the C theorem in two dimensions. There are all kinds of things also with comparisons to gravity and the RT formula and so on. Uh, I think it's, I think as physics, it's pretty clear it's correct, even if the precise framework for mathematical proof isn't quite available. Um, I think there are lots of things that are accepted in physics whose rigorous status is not different. Um, I, I'd actually like to sketch the proof of the ANIC. But there are some other situations in physics where the absence of an appropriate regulator is considered to be a serious problem. Like, for example, that the fact that we don't know how to regularize chiral gauge theories in over theory, this is considered to be a serious problem by some people in Lattice QCD. Well, here you are saying the fact that there's no regulator, well, uh, you think it's not important. Well, it's, let's uh, discuss this, if you don't mind. Since there's no lattice regulator, the rigorous status of QCD is less, sorry, the rigorous status of the full standard model is less clear than the rigorous status of QCD. Yeah. The fact is, I'll now make two statements about both of those. From a mathematical point of view, neither of them is fully rigorous. And as a physicist, I consider them both well established. The one is known to have a satisfactory lattice regulator and the other not. So I do not consider the status of these proofs to be worse than the status of the full standard model. But I'd like to tell you the proof of the ANIC because then we can. Uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not very good at drawing. I, I'm not set up well to draw. I can try. So we have a cut. Okay. Maybe I should just have found the slide with the null plane. This is meant to be a null plane, and then we have a later cut. Okay. And then um, we have that operator. 
Yes, let me try to tell you the more rigorous version of this. The more rigorous version is to use the modular operator, not, not to talk about density matrices, but um, we take the vacuum state and we take the region to the future of a cup, and then we take its full modular operator. That's rigorous. And we take the logarithm of the full modular operator. And the claim is that for any cup, the logarithm of the full module operator, I can't really draw. It's that operator I called K sub F, but the interval goes from minus infinity to infinity instead of just above the cup. Let me, instead of doing this, sorry. I want to go to where I had the formula for K sub F. I hope I had a formula for case above. Okay, so case of F is this integral above the cup. And that's supposed to be the logarithm of the density matrix above the cup. As we know, in quantum field theory, density matrices aren't rigorous, but modular operators are. And I claim that if we take the integral from minus infinity to infinity instead of only above the cup, this would be the logarithm of the modular operator. Replace sigma F by delta, the modular operator for the same cup. So the same argument will show that log delta f was given by this integral. And then we use the rigorous statement that when you make the region smaller, the modular operator becomes more positive. So log delta f increases. And that statement is the ANEC. That statement says, the ANEC is the statement that this integral, if you go from minus infinity to plus infinity, is an increasing function of f. Th that's equivalent to the ANEC. Is that clear or am I confusing you? Uh, if I yeah, it's, it's more or less clear. So I, for example, I, I, the immediate question which comes to mind is that for f equals zero, you said that this statement uh, is, um, is a mathematical theorem, the Sunyana Wichmann theorem, but for example, for general F, do mathematicians manage to prove this rigorously oh. that, that the modular generator is what it is written here? I think yes. the answer is no, it's not in the literature, but it's much closer to what's rigorous than other things, than any statement involving density matrices because it doesn't involve density matrices. Okay. Another thing you should bear in mind is that mathematicians don't have stress tensors. So they try to prove statements about quantum field theory without using a local stress tensor. Mm -hmm. So they're handicapped with rigorous proofs. So I'm afraid in answering, in answering a question like yours, I try to extrapolate with a little physics knowledge. Uh, I, try to, I try to not take literally what the mathematicians say because I think they can handicap themselves a little bit too much with their limited assumptions about quantum field theory. So uh, I think this would be a rigorous theorem if the mathematicians had more realistic assumptions about quantum field theory, but otherwise without any radical extension of what they know. But that's just a personal opinion. And these questions are not so, I mean, they have practical uh, questions. I mean, my questions are in a sense practical because Yes. You know, there are various frameworks in which people do quantum field theory. You know, some people use Whiteman axioms, other people use CFT axioms, other people use Haag-Kastler. And so every framework has some, uh, is not complete in a sense. And so, you know, but as long as you specify the framework, it's fine. But uh, yes, know, when I people know. start piling up assumptions uh, without clearly stating what they are, and then it's becoming confusing. But uh, so it seems to me that we, we have to use more than how Kastler to even write this statement. We, we have to use some framework which uses the stress tensor and mathematicians haven't formulated maybe it's uh, as carefully. But I wonder if you saw a recent paper by Kinsevich and Siegel with a different axiom system. Yeah, but I, I think it's a kind of orthogonal development. It's, um... uh, I think it could be significant actually, but maybe right. Let's say it adds a new direction maybe, but I, it's not clearly, in my opinion, extending all these other frameworks. It's, yeah, yeah. it's-, it's, it's Can more I go stuff. back? 
Can I go back to the question of the standard model? I was surprised by Ed's uh, re reply on that. I mean, I think we generally think that uh, QCD is uh, a non-perturbative ultraviolet complete theory, but the standard model, would you say the same thing? Ah, oh, sorry. It's not asymptotically free, so it's not. I should have given a better example of a chiral, but asymptotically free theory. Okay. It, our discussion standard. was using chirality. So okay. take the standard model, but replace, instead of triplet and anti-triplet quarks, take some triplets and an anti-sextet. I see, okay. And then, so the, then the standard model as, as it stands is probably okay. not a complete theory, right? You're completely correct. I, right. Um, I was Thank trying you. to, okay. Uh, okay, I, no, I understand. I, <laughs> thanks a lot. I just was curious. Okay, thanks. I was trying to convince Slava that sometimes as physicists, we're satisfied with the existence of things even though um, we don't completely have the regulator where we can do the right thing. I, I, I go along with that, yes. <laughs> can, I, can I just ask uh, one more question? So if, if we could go back, perhaps you could say a bit more words about this cancellation of UV divergences in S generalized when you have the correction to G Newton and the area, man. this works for any matter content is it, is it obvious that it must work for any matter content that it's so universal? Well, it's been demonstrated that one loop order for any matter content. If you want to go past one loop, you'd have to rely on abstract arguments. Um, let me just tell you basically how it's proved and you can judge for yourself. So first of all, how do you calculate the entropy? Well, usually people use the replica trick. So you calculate trace of sigma to the n near n equals one. Now remember sigma, we computed by taking up a half line and rotating by an angle two pi. So now we want to rotate it by an angle two pi n. So that creates a conical singularity with a very small deficit angle. So now we're doing, a, now we're studying a quantum field theory in a cone that's almost flat, but it has a slight deficit angle. And um, it has a U to V divergence which is proportional to the deficit angle. But you see, there's a curvature singularity at the deficit angle. If you, if you integrate the Einstein equations, Einstein action perpendicular, if you integrate the Einstein action in that background, the integral of R times the square root of G would be the deficit angle times the area of the cut, the area of the horizon. So, um, the divergence of the quantum field in this conical space time that you use to calculate the divergence of the entropy can be understood as the divergence. How do you calculate the divergence of the, the, the renormalization of the Einstein action? You look at a quantum field in the curved space time. In addition to the usual infinities, it has various new infinities that involve the curvature. One of them is a multiple of the integral of the square root of g times r. And you interpret that as a renormalization of the Einstein action. And that's the same one that comes in when you calculate the, dense, the divergence in the entanglement entropy, because you compute that when you compute trace, you're creating this small curvature singularity. So what I've told you is what Saskan and Ogwam said in their original paper. And then, well, I can't claim to be an expert in all the papers, but I think it stood up. People have certainly looked at it more closely afterwards. And and now this this argument you gave today can can confirms that, right? That the fact that it worked. Uh, well, that this uh, wall, iron wall definition, that it's finite, then it, it confirms that it was a good, uh, a good. Well, the, the fact that it, yeah, well, the fact that the, the fact that the, the fact that the generalized second wall is true does confirm that the generalized entropy is a good thing to define, if that's what you're asking. Right, and that it's uh, and that it's finite, no? That it's uh... yes. What we really computed with the changes are finite, but yes. Right, that's true. Thank you. But there is uh, just one comment about that. There is another way that people try to argue about the finiteness of S gen, yes, which is if you believe the one loop version of the RT formula, then it's computing some entanglement entropy on the boundary theory, 
Yes. But all the divergences of the boundary entanglement entropy are captured by this IR divergence in the in the ADS. Yes. So there shouldn't be any more local divergences in ADS in the bulk. Yes. That's well, you're drawing attention to important facts. But I actually think it's better to already know that S gen is important, is, is finite, and then interpret that as confirmation that the RT formula and its quantum correction makes sense. Yeah. Well, yeah, you can organize things in different ways. What you're saying is certainly important. Any more questions? Uh, if I may, I asked this on Slack, uh, but maybe I can ask it now. And Slava had replied to. So, in the proof of the C theorem, uh, I believe since we were varying the length of the interval R, we are working actually at a point where the correlation length is finite. And then we probe the UV and the IR by taking the R to be very small or very large. And it's not, it wasn't completely clear to me when R is very large compared to the correlation length, what the actual formula is for the entanglement entropy. Sorry, when you say the correlation length, that term usually is used in a massive theory. The correlation length is one over the mass of the lightest particle. Right, so we are along some RG flow and- If there is correlation length, it means the IR theory is trivial. And then C is zero in the infrared in that case. So if you want C to be non-trivial in the infrared, correlation length isn't the right phrase. There's okay, some maybe- I should, sorry. Yeah, Probably what you meant when you said correlation length was the mass of the mass of particles. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's some length below which the theory was a C, CFT in the UV. Yeah. Some other length above which it's a CFT in the IR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but not necessarily. And then yeah. we compared C, well, we compared the entanglement entropy in the UV and in the IR. Yeah. And my question was, so the quantity we compared was R, D, S, D, R. Yes. And so for that to be equal to C, I, R, the formula for the entanglement entropy, we have to believe that it's C, I, R times log of R times some length scale. And my question was basically, what is that length scale? Is it the UV cutoff or? If you're interested in, if your question was, what's the length scale we should use to be in the I, R? It should be bigger than the Compton wavelength of the most massive particle. You see, yeah. take take a large interval long compared to the Compton wavelengths. Mm -hmm. Massive particles can be entangled, but the entanglement won't involve both ends simultaneously if we're if the distance is large. Mm -hmm. So the massive particles will contribute to S, but not to the SDR. Uh -huh. Once the length is bigger than the Compton wavelength of the massive particles. The SDR doesn't involve entanglement near one end. The R dependence only involves somehow modes that know about both ends. Mm -hmm. Those are only the modes whose wavelength is comparable to or bigger than R. Right, right. Well, I was wondering about what the expression for S of R would be if we don't take a derivative. And so there would be a log R with the coefficient CIR. I'm not going to have an exact formula if that's what you're asking for. All that we right. know is it's monotonic. It has well, it's a logarithm with one coefficient in the IR and a logarithm with a possibly bigger coefficient in UV. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's hard, going to be hard to say more. I think Raghu is asking what is the natural argument of the logarithm? It's the radius divided by some characteristic scale. And in the UV, we, we assumed it was the UV cutoff. But in the IR CFT, probably it's more like this characteristic length scale of the massive particle, right? Oh, that's, well, that's, I think what Raghu is suggesting. Well, I prefer to phrase it is to say, what's the length scale at which the two formulas are valid? So the IR formula is valid at lengths bigger than the longest Compton wavelength of a massive particle, roughly speaking. Or you could express it in terms of the leading irrelevant deformation away from the CFT. And that would give you a length scale that you need to be above. You need to be at lengths big enough that these IRCFT is a good description. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other question?
Can I ask a question about your earlier lecture on curved manifolds? Sure. Um, I know that there are arguments in Euclidean space to get uh, renormalized perturbation theory, but in general, if you know that a quantum field theory exists on a curved manifold in Euclidean space, can you say anything about Minkowski space? Well, there are classical approaches. I mean, there are classical theorems that actually Slava is the one she has rather than me about okay. classical theorems that continue from Euclidean to Minkowski space. But there must be some limits on that. You have to have something that some simple manifold in some direction to call time or to put introduce oh. a. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, if you want to make brick rotation, uh, so this recent paper tried to axiomatize what class of complex metrics a quantum field theory is defined in and mm -hmm. tried to deduce some traditional statements and standard approaches from their axioms. I thought it was interesting, actually. Um, what paper is that? By Konsevich and Siegel. Uh huh. Okay. Actually, Edward, I, I wanted to say that, you know, I'm probably the only person here who knows that you have another lecture in 20 minutes. So if you if you have to, you probably need a break. So please, uh, we don't want to exhaust you too much before your next lecture. So yeah, thanks a lot for great lectures. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Indeed, I, I did not know. Yeah. So let's, let's all thank Edward for these great lectures and for his infinite patience answering all our questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks.